everybody. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, we are in a different location, but God is still good. Amen. Yeah. Um, it's good to see everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jay. I'm the pastor here uh, at Greenwood Hill. Uh, we are blessed this morning to have First Baptist Church family. Can we give it up for them? Uh, we have been part of it for three or four years? Five years. How long have you been here? Wow, we've been here six years. So, so apparently I can't count. Okay, fine.
and we're going to sing about what a mighty fortress our God is. But when the agitators come and the stresses come in our life, we have a shield, the fortress, and the buckler that keeps us. Amen. If you would stand with me.
Praise the Lord. Amen. Now to get used to the difference between the Baptist hymnal and the way we do it at Freedom, okay? But I was thinking, I was thinking today about how we have no problem talking about the greatness of God, how God is marvelous, how God is omniscient, how God is omnipresent. And he's all of these things to us. But a lot of times we fail to make the connection of where we fit in all of that because the creator of the universe also has a relationship with us. Amen. And even though it seems nice to some that we do have this relationship, in all actuality, we actually need to have this relationship with God. We need Him. When we look at this world around us, we can see that we need the Lord. We need Him because the world is wicked. We need Him to give us the power of the Holy Spirit that works within us. So this final hymn is not in the book, but I'm sure you all know it. If you don't, you will know the, the chorus of this song. It's I need thee every hour.
It is a privilege that we get to gather. It is a privilege that we get to know you. It is a privilege that we can come before your throne.
Enforcement Services to a little bit of a party. Y'all really got me today, right? Yeah, we fell right? Um, amen, but we are delighted to be back in the house of the Lord one more time. It's always a privilege. It doesn't matter what's going on, right? Things may be less than ideal, but every time we get to do this, we ought to be grateful and be glad we enter into his days of thanksgiving, into his course with praise. So as we continue in our worship, I want us to look into the word of the Lord. So just to reset, good morning to everybody once again. Uh, to those who do not know me, my name is CJ, and I'm one of the pastors here at Freedom Point to Know. Um, this morning we are continuing in our journey through the book of Nehemiah. Um, many of you know that we started a series last week entitled Rebuild. So we want to pick up from where we left off. And last week we talked, or we walked through rather chapter number one in the book of Nehemiah. And in doing so, we spent some time considering the problem that Nehemiah ran into. Nehemiah's problem, his problem, was that he had received some bad news. He received bad news about the condition of his people, his people in Jerusalem. And, he, and the news also consisted of bad news concerning the state of the city itself. And Nehemiah, having received this bad news, we saw how it began to break him down. And he began to weep. And he began to mourn. Why? Because he actually cared deeply about his people and his place. Right? Then we encounter Nehemiah's prayerful response to the problem. Right? Nehemiah began, as the text says, to, to fast and to pray. Not just a time or two, but it says he did it continually. Praying to the God that he feared and honored. And finally we saw God's providence in Nehemiah's life. What do we mean by God's providence? God providentially had placed Nehemiah in the position of being the cupbearer to the king in Persia, which potentially would allow Nehemiah to have the ear of the king. And Nehemiah recognized this providence, and therefore he asked God to grant him mercy and success with the king. And this is where we left off last week, right at the end of chapter 1. And this is where we now will pick up spending our time this week in chapter number 2. But before we go any further, let's ask the Lord to bless our time in the Word today. Amen. Father, we come with hearts of gratitude and thanksgiving. Uh, God, we come with reverent hearts as well, knowing that you are the God who is holy and perfect, and in you there is light and there dwells no darkness of God. You are altogether glorious. So, Lord God, we count it as a privilege to actually get to worship you and to hear your word, oh God. So may we treat your word with the honor and the respect that you are due. It was his to hear. I was to apply what we hear. May Christ be magnified and your people be built up. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Regarding our text of scripture today, Nehemiah chapter 2, we could in one sense say that this entire chapter displays or showcases how God answers the prayers of his people as his people prevail continually in prayer. For a minute, I just want us to take a look at one of the verses that we looked at last week, which was Nehemiah chapter 1, verse number 11. In that verse, it says this, Nehemiah praying said, O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Who's the man that he's asking to be granted mercy in, in the sight of? The king. Because it concludes by saying, now I was cupbearer to the king. So Nehemiah was ultimately asking God to grant him favor with King Artaxerxes. But the question is, 
Why did Nehemiah need favor? What did he want favor for? The answer to that question is because Nehemiah planned to communicate something to the king. He planned to say something to the king. Why? Because Nehemiah ultimately desired to do something. He wanted to say something to the king so that could lead to him actually doing something. Nehemiah, brothers and sisters, he wanted to take action in light of the problem that he learned about in Jerusalem. So I want you to notice that he didn't just ask God to rebuild the wall for them. Not, that's not what his prayer was. Now certainly the rebuilding of the wall was, was, was what Nehemiah wanted, but she recognized that uh, that was only possible with the help of the living God. Yet his prayer, though, and the way he prayed, and what he said when he prayed, it presumes that Nehemiah saw himself as being desirous of being a part of the solution. Not just asking God to do it all. In other words, he wasn't asking God to rebuild the walls while he waited for God to perform a miracle. It's not what he prays for you. He, he's not asking God to rebuild, to rebuild the walls while he himself just kind of, you know, just do his own thing because surely God will call somebody else to do it rather than the invite. Like one of the church leaders. He doesn't just ask God to rebuild the walls and then quickly move on to something else that he deems more important. Because if he did, brothers and sisters, this would be kind of like equivalent to us saying, God, I, 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 I see, I see that my family is currently broken down. Things in my family are not what they ought to do, God. So I'm asking that you, God, by your grace, will please restore my family and bless my family. And then we go on to not change anything about our personal lives. Like, if we were previously or partially neglecting our familial duties, what good would it be for us to ask God to restore our family if we don't plan on changing how we function in the context of our family? It'd be like us saying, God, I see that my church needs help in accomplishing the mission that is set before it. So God, please raise this church up to be a beacon of light in this community and a hub for the gospel to go forth and change lives. But then, what would that prayer mean if we only just occasionally show up for an hour and a half on Sunday? Yeah. And leave the work to be done by others. Right? What would that prayer mean if we failed to give all of our talents and all of our efforts to God, guess how? Through the church. When we're serving in the church, we're offering worship to the living God through the church. I love what Matthew Henry says about this. And he talks about this. If you've ever been in a situation where somebody, uh, there's a motion, and then somebody says, I second that motion, Here's what Matthew Henry says. He says, our prayers must be seconded, if you will, or accompanied with our serious endeavors. He said, or else we mock God. God, I really want you to do this. I have no intention on being an instrument to be used to do it in the way that you say it ought to be done. I just want you to do it. He says we mock God. Now, I want us to look now at the first three verses in chapter 2. The first three verses in chapter 2, and it says this. It says, in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, and I says, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, verse 3, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad? In the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire. At the beginning of this chapter, we see that we are now set in this month 
of Nisan, and this month corresponds to what we call the month of March. And this month of Nisan was about three to four months after the month of Chislev, which we learned about in chapter number one. And Chislev is the month when Nehemiah learned about the disturbing news of his people. Right? And Nehemiah here, he explains what happens on this particular occasion when he was in the king's presence working as the cupbearer. And on this particular occasion, Nehemiah happened to be wearing his sadness on his face. He did not Hide. So the first thing that we encounter, brothers and sisters, here is we see Nehemiah's pain. We see Nehemiah's pain, and this again, as we saw from last week, this is a prevailing pain. This is a lingering sadness, a lingering type of hurt that Nehemiah felt, and yes, experienced back in chapter one. But I want you to think about this. If that was three or four months ago, that means he's been carrying this hurt for three or four months ago. And here, his pain is so palpable, and, and, and it's so visible that it apparently, and maybe unintentionally, it ends up presenting Nehemiah with an opportunity. His pain presented him an opportunity. Why? Because the king took notice of Nehemiah's pain and said, and he asked him, well, why are you sad? And in verse 3, Nehemiah responds to the king in a way that I would call humble, wise, clever, and even courageous. He starts with humility, y'all, by saying this, let the king live forever. What's he doing? He's showing the proper honor to the king. Right? In his humility, he shows the proper honor to the king, and then he speaks honestly to the king. Honestly, but still humbly. Right? And as he begins to tell the king what's going on, he displays a level of courage. And why would I say that? Because at the end of verse 2, it said that Nehemiah was very afraid. And yet, he continues on. In fact, the way this, 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 this fear that is discussed, the way it's described in the Hebrew, it indicates a kind of a, a multiplied fear, if you will. In fact, the word that is used there is the same word that we see all the way back in Genesis where it says be fruitful and multiply, saying his fear was greatly multiplied. And it resulted probably from the fact, y'all, uh, that I know this may not be true of our times, but it resulted in the fact that it was not normal in those days. Nor was it deemed gracious, no good, for one to appear in the king's presence with a sad, downtrodden countenance. That wasn't normal. So that's probably what prompted the king to ask Nehemiah why was he sad what was going on. And this is probably what caused Nehemiah to experience this great fear. But nonetheless, what does he do? He presses on and he states the reason for his pain, but he does it by way of asking a question. Nehemiah almost says, King, who wouldn't be sad if their city, if their place, if the place where their father's graves were now in complete and utter ruin and the gates have been destroyed by fire, he said, King, who would not be sad about this? Now let's look at the first section of verse 4 to see what the king says in response. So then the king said to me, he said, what are you requesting? So apparently by the grace of God, Nehemiah now seems to have the attention of the king, right? The king wants to know what it is that Nehemiah wants in light of his sadness. But now I want you to look at how Nehemiah immediately responds to the king at the end of verse 4. Because of course that would be the prudent thing to do, right? The king asks him a question, he needs to immediately Respond. He needs to seize the opportunity. He needs to tell the king as quickly as possible. Wait. That's not actually what we see. We actually are introduced to something else first. At the end of verse 4, we're introduced to Nehemiah's prayer. When the king asked Nehemiah what he wanted, Nehemiah's immediate response was to pray again. But hadn't this man prayed enough already? <laughs> think, think about what we, what we 
we've already read it. Hasn't he already <clears throat> been, been steeped in prayer before God? I mean, in chapter 1 it said that he had prayed and fasted continually. Right? And then in verse number 11 of chapter 1, we saw that he had already asked God to bring to mercy and success in the sight of the king. However, I think we see something from Nehemiah that we need to also cling to. We see that Nehemiah believed something. He believed that seeking the Lord was necessary not only before the endeavor starts, but it was also necessary during the endeavor. Prayer was apparently a part of this man's lifestyle. This is what he lived by. This was obviously characteristic of Nehemiah. He knew that if he was going to have success, he knew that if he was going to have guidance to know what to say and how to say it, he needed the help of his God. In fact, he knew that he needed God to work on and prepare the heart of the king and maybe he even ask God for courage or boldness to say what he to be saying. Thanks to God, may we be a people like this. Right? May we be the type of people where prayer goes before us, before we take action, during our action, and even after we take action. What I'm arguing and what I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, is that prayer must surround us on every side. Prayer must surround us on every side. Like if you could imagine how military troops would surround their enemy if they were able to trap him and they close him in. That's how prayer must surround us. In order to ensure, just as those military troops would be doing, in order to ensure our victory and our success. And this is why Paul, I think, picks up on it in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul's talking about the armor of God, when he says that we must be what? Praying at all times in the spirit. But from Nehemiah's example, I think we need to learn from the kind of prayer that this is. Because this would not seem to be one of those solemn, extended prayer times. You know the kind where you have you got time to go get your prayer closet. <laughs> that you planned out. That's not what this is, right? Now we can presume from chapter 1 when it says he was fasting and praying continually that he had those set aside intentional times of prayer in which he labored before God in that way. But that's not what this is. Because the reality is there are moments in time, brothers and sisters, in the real world when life is happening fast. Yes, and all we really have time to do is just to cry out to God immediately. Sometimes that's how it is. We don't have time to get to our prayer closet. And it is in these moments, brothers and sisters, that I want you to know that we have both the ability and the need to call on God to be there, right in and there when we need Him. We can actually even do it in our own heart and spirit because there's nothing here that says, I don't know that Nehemiah said this out loud. But here's what I want you to see. Those kind of prayers count just as much as the solid prayers. Yeah. In fact, the combination of both styles of prayer into our day-to-day lives, what it actually does is it characterizes the lives of people who actually and truly fear God. Because at times when we're in trouble, sometimes, listen, I remember years ago, sometimes people just say, oh, you got to just, just call Jesus. You hear people, they just yell out Jesus. That's, that's, because that's all there's time for in that moment. Trouble is surrounding me. I gotta make a quick decision. Something has to happen now. Right? And all I got time to do is call on the living God. When your life is in danger, all you gotta do is call God right in the day. That's it. When temptation is staring you right in the face, you need to call God right then and there. When temptation is at your door, you don't got time to go home and pray. <laughs> When your flesh rises up and you are feeling spiritually weak, ill-equipped to overcome the sin in that moment, and you need strength in that exact moment for whatever it is, whether it's sin or just you're feeling weak and you need strength, you have to call on God right then and there with the kind of urgency that I'm telling you actually pleases the Lord. He takes delight in it. See, even our Lord Jesus 
create these kinds of short, sudden, spontaneous prayers. Yeah, we know that Jesus often went through to the mountain with the Father to pray intentionally, but Jesus also prayed these short, sudden, spontaneous prayers, right? Sometimes he did that. You know when he did that? He did that when he was on the cross. Right? Consider the scene. He's up there being ridiculed. Right? He's suffering immensely beyond what any of us can imagine. They're mocking him, right? The thieves are mocking him. All the things are happening. All these things are going on. And then we hear the words of Luke 23, 34. Jesus suddenly says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. This is also what we find our brother Stephen doing in Acts 7, 59 through 60, when he's literally being stoned to death. Where's he going to go? Right then in that moment, as they're stoning him, he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Brothers and sisters, I'm just trying to encourage you. You need to do the same thing. Yeah. Right? When fear grips you, just call Jesus right where you're at. Yeah. When you need direction or something set before you, the decision got to be made immediately, spontaneously, call out to the living God. Right? I need you to see that these kind of prayers are not somehow less powerful. They don't make you less spiritual. Instead, what they do is they actually communicate something to God. They communicate that you see that you need God at all times, not just the first thing in the morning and you're quiet. Yeah. That you need him at all times, not just right before bed, before you go to sleep at night, and not just during the corporate prayer meeting. This is what Nehemiah practices, and this is what he does here, and our Lord is pleased to help him. Look at the next thing that we see in verses 5 through 8. In verses 5 through 8, we see Nehemiah's presentation. First we saw his pain, right? Then we saw Nehemiah's prayer, and now we see his presentation. Let's read verses 5 through 8. He says, And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I might rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked in the good hand of my God. So, so now, after he quickly prays to his God, Nehemiah tells the king, exactly what he wants. But I still want you to notice that he's humbly engaging the king. Right? Nehemiah, as he engages the king, I just, I just want to point something out for us because, and, and one of the reasons why I'm parking here is because we, I, I think we live in an age now where we, we've thrown off all of these categories with respect to like how we talk to people in certain ways and how you address and what you think about authority and how you handle it and how you deal with these types of things. How do I know? I've been teaching middle schoolers all year and very and various times. I have to tell them that's not how you talk to an adult. Don't be so presumptuous. These categories are being lost, right? Right amongst us in our society. But I want you to notice what Nehemiah does. This is really, he does not engage the king with a level of presumption. He does not engage the king with a level of audaciousness. He's not naively assuming that somehow the king owes him something. Nehemiah recognizes who the king is, and he knows by God's wisdom how he must prudently speak to him. I'm reminded of the words in Proverbs 16 and 15. It says, in the light of the king's face, there is life. And then it says, in the king's favor is like the clouds that bring the spring rain. Nehemiah knows that it needs the favor of the king. So Nehemiah starts like this. He says, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just trying to tell, tell y'all, I hope y'all see that the way we speak to people actually does that. 
Because there's a way to address things and speak to people in a way. Here's what I want to tell you, here's what it does when you, when you nail this. It actually disarms the person that you're going to. Particularly if you need something from them. I know, right? This, this is like, kind of like some of y'all saying, yeah, this is pretty basic. But is it? It, dis it can disarm the person. And guess what? There's a way in which you can engage in which it almost inclines that individual's ears closer to you, that they desire to hear you, and if at all possible, give you what it is that you're asking for. And I'm just arguing that as Christians, I think we need to learn more skills. We actually do. Why? Because that's what Proverbs talks about. We can learn these skills as they're skills that can be learned. And what do we learn them? We learn them in the school of Christ. In the Word, through Christ, growing in Christ, Proverbs talks about how the wise make knowledge attractive. Proverbs 25, 15 says, with patience, or with forbearance, it says, a ruler may be persuaded. And a soft tongue will break a bone. Now, I'm not encouraging any of us to start becoming flatterers. Why? Because I don't want you to be in sin. Flattering people is a disingenuous way to try to make them get what you want. That's not what you talk about. But what I am saying is that we actually want to have the Spirit move in our hearts to produce, I'm talking about, a genuinely humble disposition that produces genuinely attractive speech for those who hear. That's what I'm saying. We want the Spirit to work in our hearts to produce a genuinely humble disposition that produces genuinely attractive speech for those who hear. And in verse 6, we see that after Nehemiah inquired, right? Well, after, after inquiring, the king inquired of Nehemiah, how long are you going to be gone? Nehemiah answers him, and then it pleased the king to say yes to what Nehemiah requested. But that wasn't all Nehemiah needed because in verses 7 and 8, Nehemiah is saying, I, I also need letters, I need letters to the governors, right, of the province beyond the river. Why? Because he needed to be let through safely. And then he says, I need a letter to Asaph because Asaph was the keeper of the king's forest and Nehemiah wanted and needed timber in order to do the work that was set before him. And then at the end of verse 8 and verse 9, the next thing we see is God's provision. God's provision. So what am I saying? In one sense, while it was obvious that the king was the one who had to say yes to everything that Nehemiah asked for, Nehemiah knew the reason why the king said yes. Look at the end of verse number 8 and verse 9. The last sentence of verse 8 says, And the king granted me what I asked. Why? For the good hand of my God was upon me. The good hand of my God was upon me. Then verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king has sent me, sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. Y'all see all this favor in here? Yeah. All this favor, right? But, but, but Nehemiah rightly understood what was happening. He rightly saw that his favor was because the hand of God was actually upon him. This is why the king gave him what he asked for. Matter of fact, Nehemiah even received a convoy of officers to accompany him, accompany him on his journey. Nehemiah lived in Persia as a cupbearer, but he left for Jerusalem with the blessing and the certification of the king. This is what God did. Brothers and sisters, when God gives us a task, right? When God gives us a task, and when we are indeed, according to Psalm 127, dedicated to building his house, right? As Psalm 127 teaches us, when God gives us that task and we set ourselves to do that, God is the one who's also going to give us what we need to accomplish. He is. That's why sometimes he gives it to us through other people as he works through their hearts and minds. I'm reminded of Proverbs 21.1. In Proverbs 21.1, it says this, it says, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He 
see, the Lord turns it wherever he wills. That's what God does. This is the God that we serve, y'all. Right? He uses whom he wants. Right? To give his people what he wants. In order to accomplish what he wants to do. The operative word in all this is what God wants. I, I need God's will. That's what he does. And all of it for what? For God's own glory. Which is why Psalm 127 says, At last the laborer, and let the Lord builds the house. All of our labor is in vain. Because all of this is for God's glory alone. That's what we're building. We're not talking about building our own stuff. For our own glory. This is all for the glory of God. But this, brothers, this is this great news for us. This ought to be exhilarating for you even as you sit here and hear this. This ought to humble you. Why? Because we should be humbled to know that we are instruments in the hand of the Redeemer. That's who we are. And to be honest with you, at many different times, as instruments, sometimes we're dull instruments. We are. But nonetheless, he takes and uses that dull instrument to bring about and accomplish what he desires. And we see that happening right in the life of Nehemiah in this text. Nehemiah is an instrument being used by God to be an instrument to bless his people. You know what that kind of foreshadows? Christ. Christ, right? Christ would ultimately, this would minimize the orders in some small sense, pointing towards, right? Because this can't be fine, but we'll see that when we get to the end of the book, right? This is something that was only going to be temporary, spoiler alert. Right? What Christ does, at the, what Christ ends up doing is finality to it. Christ ends up ultimately redeeming and restoring what has been made desolate in our souls and in all of creation. This, brothers and sisters, is all God's providence, all God's provision, and all God's blessing. And thus, the environment is able to go in peace. So at this point, everything is going great, right? Until you read the first verse, the first word of verse 10. What's the first, the first verse you see in verse 10? But, everything is going great. But hold up. I want you to think about what's happening, though. We're saying God's provision, things are going well, God's providing. Nehemiah is worshiping, recognizing that God's providing. Nehemiah is being obedient. He talks to the king. God grants him favor. Everything is going well. But right after this, we see a sneak peek of the opposition that is now to come. That's what we see. It's almost as if the writer has given us a foretaste as to what is to come. Just a few verses later. He's laying the groundwork for the opposition. Brothers and sisters, I just want y'all to see this. This opposition is necessary. It's going to come. If you're doing the work of ministry, you're doing the work of the Lord, you will be opposed. You will be opposed by people who know they're opposing you, and you might even be opposed by people who don't really even know they're opposing you. Now, in other words, it may not be the intention, but I want you to look at verse 10. I want you to look at verse 10. You're going to see these, these two gentlemen named quite a bit as we go through this book. But when Sam Ballad, the Horonite, and Tobiah and the Ammonite servant heard this, heard what? What Nehemiah was planning to do. It displeased them greatly. That's a lie. <laughs> it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Why would you be so upset about this? I don't know. I've been asking that question all the time, too. About various things. It doesn't seem to match when you first read it. Like, why, like, why am I so upset about this? But here, we're introduced again to these two men that we're going to see. And these men, they're first described, brothers and sisters, by what they feel about what me and my story. This news that apparently reached them, and it says it greatly displeased them. Why? Here's what we need to think about. Probably because for them, the way they saw it, 
the strengthening of Jerusalem will consequently mean the weakening, to some degree, of the surrounding nations and peoples in which they were part of. So it's like, we can have, we can have Jerusalem being built back up. That's going to hurt us. Right? And, and, and these men, who many scholars believe to be from Samaria in some sense, they did not in any wise, they did not desire the welfare or the blessing of the Israelites. What I'm trying to get y'all to see is the reality that some people dislike the fact and will dislike the fact that you are trying to save through Christ not around you and bless your society. They just won't like it. And they will oppose you. Some people will oppose the fact and dislike the fact that you are trying to be in a positive influence through the light of the gospel, not through human works, through the gospel and all its implications, trying to be a light and an influence in your society. They won't like it. See, here's the reality, brothers and sisters. As long as we as Christians, as long as we're content to stay out of trying to influence society with the gospel and all of its implications, and as long as, 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 as we forget, right, we always say we are the light of the world. Well, you know what light does to darkness? It dispels it. Which necessarily means that there's interaction and engagement an impact being had on the darkness by the light. There's no other way to read that. Right? But as long as you're saying, that's fine. We're just going to be the light over here. She's in our church. As long as you deal with that. As long as you don't want the gospel and implications to impact society. And as long as you stay in your church and say things like, we're just going to keep church separate from culture, separate from politics and all that stuff. What I'm here to tell you is actually the unbelievers won't mind you very much. <laughs> because you're not a threat to them. I hope y'all got that. They don't view you as a threat. That's why they're like, fine, sure, just go ahead in your, in your church walls, have your little prayer service, do all of those things. Don't bother me. Y'all. Don't bother us out here. As long as, if you get to bring that out here and telling us what now we must do, you'll see how quickly they turn into St. Valley and Tobiah. Because that's, but this is what we call to, brothers and sisters. They will actually oppose these things, right? Yet in spite of this, in verses 11 through 18, we're not going to read all of it. In spite of this, in verses 11 through 18, we see how Nehemiah's plan develops. I'll just read some verses there. Verse 11, Nehemiah, it says, So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. In verse 13, I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dumb gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Jump down to verse 16. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision or shame. Verse 18. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up with them. So they strengthened their hands. Good word. So Nehemiah, he goes to Jerusalem for the days. Took some people with him, but he kept the news about the God and put it in his heart. He kept that to himself. Nehemiah then he wisely goes and inspects the city. He inspects the broken down walls of Jerusalem and the condition. Why? Because how do you want to know what the solution is and what you need to fix if you haven't first seen the problem? Right? So he goes and does that. Now by the time we get to verse 17, Nehemiah, we find him rallying his troops, rallying the people together, right? And he does this how? He identifies for them clearly this is what the problem is. And 
then you didn't just leave it there because you know some people are good at that part. This is the problem I see. But then he offers them a solution. But now, notice that he didn't say the solution was just, okay guys, so this is the problem, and here's what I'm gonna do. He said, here's the problem, here's what we need to do. There's no way that could accomplish this by himself. So how does he sell them all this stuff? His selling point was, was him grounding their success in God. He grounds their success, the success that he says is forthcoming, he grounds it in God. In other words, he says, he talks to them about how God was blessing his efforts already. And that God's hand had been upon them, and then he gives them the why also. What's the why? He said, so that we won't be suffering the original shame anymore. He gives them a why. He gives them a ground, which serves as the basis for their confidence to know that they're going to be successful, right? And Nehemiah does all of this by being righteously and properly persuasive, right? He approached the matter wisely. Why? Because he knew he needed the people. And in verse 18, what did they do? They agreed to do the work. Brothers and sisters, where I want you all to see this morning, and as we continue to go through the series, I want you to see. There is so much opportunity set right before us right now as a church. Like, I need you to see that. There's so much opportunity, right, for us to do so much good work right in our, you see, we, we all, I think we always start at the wrong place. Y'all know where, if y'all heard me enough, y'all know where I'm about to say we started, right? In your family. We always try to change the world, but won't do anything different. There's so much good that's set before us as a people, but it needs to start in your household, in your family, so that they are equipped and so that your household is functionally doing what God said a household is supposed to do, and thus glorifying God, and in that way, contributing properly to the church that you're a part of. There's so much to be done. Good work in our families. Yes, in our church and in the culture by the grace of God. So we would all do well to see and identify the problems that we see in our communities and in our nation. We all would be good to see that. We do well. We need more people. I talk to the men about this all the time. To be like the sons of Issachar, who it says they understood the times. We have to know what time it is and identify it. But that's not all we need. We got to do more than that. Why am I saying that? Because do y'all think that Nehemiah's brethren didn't see how bad things were before Nehemiah got there? They already knew. They knew that it was bad, right? And it, but it, it was seemingly relatively easy to, for them to be persuaded, but they were only persuaded to do this work when somebody came to leave them. Immediately, though, they saw this as an undertaking worth putting their hands to the plow for. So, yes, this is why we do need leaders. And I'm, and I'm not just saying leaders in the official sense. We just need people with this kind of mentality. It's not just set aside for pastors and deacons. We need people with this Nehemiah spirit and attitude and perspective right amongst us, right? Those who can rally the troops, so to speak. Those who can give them a vision to see, here's what we need to be doing, and here's what we can do, and here's how God can be glorified in the work. We need that. We need those who can speak plainly, yet humbly, to the people that they need to aid them in the work. Because remember, Nehemiah was just a regular guy. As we saw last week, he wasn't a pastor. In some sense, he was a regular guy. This puts the onus on all of us, right? Because the reality is, brothers and sisters, we all get to seek and we all get to help God for wisdom. All of us. God's wisdom is the thing that gives us conviction. What did they have? Conviction. Wisdom from God is the thing that gives us boldness. What did they have? Boldness. God's wisdom. 
from Holy Scripture is the thing that gives us clarity. Wouldn't it be in my head with all these assignments and we need it to be done? Clarity. God's wisdom increasingly gives us the ability to practically apply God's glorious abstract knowledge into the real world that we actually live in. That's what God's wisdom is. That's actually what wisdom is. Wisdom teaches us how to engage with and how to speak with one another. Wisdom teaches us how to encourage one another. Wisdom teaches us how to spur one another on to love and good deeds that we find out about in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. We absolutely need this, brothers and sisters. We need this. All this stuff, for me and I, I am fearing the Lord. So I ask you, what could be accomplished in and through you by you simply fearing the Lord and walking in this wisdom? I want you to think about it this week. What could be done in and through you? How might the Lord be pleased to use you? We can all embody the Spirit. Look real quick at verse 19. We almost did. Because again, now just as soon as everything's looking good, everybody's in agreement. What's the right coming at? Distraction. Distraction. The prevention attempts of the enemy. Verse 19, but when Sam battled the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant, and Gesh Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you going to rebel against the king? Here we see them again. So what's that way to try to get them distracted? Well, let's mock them and discourage them. Um, that's not an uncommon tactic. Sometimes people will try to discourage your work because they genuinely don't see that it's a, a legitimate, valid work. But sometimes people will try to discourage your work precisely because they know that it is a good work that's actually going to change something that they don't want to change. They have a different goal than what you have. Now think about what's going on with Sam Bell and Tobiah. Remember, for them, if the Israelites are going to receive welfare and be lifted up, then they're saying, well, that's going to to the impact of my So let me try to stop them by discouraging them. Right? Let me try to do that. Who else did that? Who else had the experience that Jesus did? Remember, remember how many encounters he had with the Pharisees who tried to verbally throw jabs and throw him off. Why? Because they actually saw that the people were going after Jesus in their words. They had to stop it. Sam Bell and Tobiah and Geshem, they cheered at them and despised them. They even accused them of trying to rebel against the king. Brothers and sisters, sometimes your enemies will oppose you, they use this tactic too. What am I talking about? They say something that is patently false, but now, if you decide to address it, guess what you now become? Distracted. Distracted from what? The work that God is giving you. So all I'm saying, y'all, is in light of this great opportunity that we have, in light of this clear mission and vision that we have, that we want to actually serve the king, that we actually want to be the light that dispels the darkness, that we actually want to take righteous dominion in accordance with what God had in mind for Adam and which Adam fell back and which Christ redeemed us for to restore our own ability to do that. We want to keep our eyes on all of those things for the glory of God, don't be distracted. No matter what happens, don't be distracted. And the final verse. I want you to just see how Nehemiah responded to this absurd claim. Are you trying to rebel against the king? That was the most ridiculous question that could be asked. But in verse 20, he says, Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper. And we his servants will arise and build. He says that you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. 
You know this thing about us didn't really answer that question. Because it wasn't an honest question. The question actually only served as an accusation. To do what? Distract, discourage. Nehemiah just essentially brushes it off, brushes it off. How do I know that Nehemiah kept his focus? Because he kept his eyes on God. Because how did he respond? He responded to them about how God was going to give them success. He kept his eyes on God. He did not allow himself or the people to be destroyed. As I close, brothers and sisters, I just want to point you to another who persevered or who persistently pursued the mission that was set before us, namely Christ. This one that I pray that everyone in this room knows. Right? Because there are various times when Christ, things were said to him and done to him to try to get him off track. I'm reminded of the words that in John chapter 6, when after Jesus fed, he fed the 5,000 with the two fish and five loaves of bread. It says in John 6 that Jesus perceived that they were going to try to make him king. What did he do? He left. What did he do? He withdrew to the mountain, presumably to pray to God, received strength, restored and renewed focus. Why? Because he came for a specific mission. And he was not going to let any of them, the Jews, the Pharisees, anybody, Satan himself who tried to offer him the kings of this world, the kingdoms of this world, rather than before Jesus suffered his humiliation. He said, none of you are going to stop me from doing what God gave me to do. Brothers and sisters, Jesus did accomplish his mission. So if you're here, let me tell you what that mission was. Jesus came to live a perfect life that none of us ever lived. He came to live that life and to die a sacrificial death. For who? On behalf of anyone, everyone who would believe. Everyone who would trust that Jesus actually accomplished this mission that was set before him. So all you have to do today is trust and believe that Jesus paid the penalty for your sins complete and totally. And he was raised from the dead, which proves that the Father accepted the baby. So trust Christ. Right where you are. Because he completed his mission. This is why we sit here in heavenly places today and we've received his commission. That we might go out into the world. So don't be distracted, brothers and sisters. Lay in the Lord for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you for your word. Father, your word is living, it is active, it is sharper than any two edged sword. So we trust it. Because we trust you. May we cling to it. May you apply these words to our lives. May it be a lamp to our feet, light to our pathway. That we might live lives that bring glory and honor. Father, there is none like you. Please, Father, even bless us even now as we transition into a time of communion. Remember, the great cause paid by you, our Father, in the giving of your Son, and by your Son, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us as the sacrificial lamb. We love you and we praise you.
I ask that you would go out into any, any of those places, retrieve the elements, and go back to the seat that we might partake together. Amen. Thank you. 